Hello friends and welcome. I am so glad that you are here to listen to this calm reading of the stories of an adventure on Island Rock and at 5 o'clock in the morning. Let us unwind. Let's find a safe and comfortable place to relax. Your bed, your chair, your sofa. And let us begin these stories. An Adventure on Island Rock Who was the man I saw talking to you in the hayfield? asked Aunt Kate, as Uncle Richard came to dinner. Bob Marks, said Uncle Richard briefly. I've sold Laddie to him. Ernest Hughes, the twelve-year-old orphaned boy, whom Uncle boarded and kept for the chores he did, suddenly stopped eating. Oh, Mr. Lawson, you're not going to sell Laddie, he cried chokily. Uncle Richard stared at him. Never before, in the five years that Ernest had lived with him, had the quiet little fellow spoken without being spoken to, much less ventured to protest against anything Uncle Richard might do. Certainly I am, answered the latter curtly. Bob offered me twenty dollars for the dog, and he's coming after him next week. Oh, Mr. Lawson, said Ernest, rising to his feet, his small, freckled face crimson. Oh, don't sell Laddie. Please, Mr. Lawson, don't sell him. What nonsense is this? said Uncle Richard sharply. He was a man who brooked no opposition from anybody, and who never changed his mind when it was once made up. Don't sell Laddie, pleaded Ernest miserably. He is the only friend I've got. I can't live if Laddie goes away. Oh, don't sell him, Mr. Lawson. Sit down and hold your tongue, said Uncle Richard sternly. The dog is mine, and I shall do with him as I think fit. He is sold, and that is all there is about it. Go on with your dinner. But Ernest, for the first time, did not obey. He snatched his cap from the back of his chair, dashed it down over his eyes, and ran from the kitchen with a sob, choking his breath. Uncle Richard looked angry, but Aunt Kate hastened to soothe him. Don't be vexed with the boy, Richard, she said. You know he is very fond of Laddie. He's had to do with him ever since he was a pup, and no doubt he feels badly at the thought of losing him. I'm rather sorry myself that you have sold the dog. But he is sold, and there's an end of it. I don't say but that the dog is a good dog, but he is of no use to us. And twenty dollars will come in mighty handy just now. He's worth that to Bob, for he is a good watchdog. So we've both made a fair bargain. Nothing more was said about Ernest or Laddie. I had taken no part in the discussion, for I felt no great interest in the matter. Laddie was a nice dog. Ernest was a quiet, inoffensive little fellow five years younger than myself. That was all I thought about either of them. I was spending my vacation at Uncle Richard's farm on the Nova Scotia Bay off Fundy Shore. I was a great favorite with Uncle Richard, partly because he had been much attached to my mother, his only sister, and partly because of my strong resemblance to his only son who had died several years before. Uncle Richard was a stern, undemonstrative man, but I knew that he entertained a deep and real affection for me, 
and I always enjoyed my vacation sojourns at his place. What are you going to do this afternoon, Ned? he asked, after the disturbance caused by Ernest's outbreak had quieted down. I think I'll row out to Island Rock, I replied. I want to take some views of the shore from it. Uncle Richard nodded. He was much interested in my new camera. If you're on it about four o'clock, you'll get a fine view of the hole in the wall when the sun begins to shine on the water through it, he said. I've often thought it would make a handsome picture. After I finish taking these pictures, I think I'll go down to Uncle Adam's and stay all night, I said. Jim's dark room is more convenient than mine, and he has some pictures he's going to develop tonight, too. I started for the shore about two o'clock. Ernest was sitting on the woodpile as I passed through the yard, with his arms about Laddie's neck and his face buried in Laddie's curly hair. Laddie was a handsome and intelligent black-and-white Newfoundland, with a magnificent coat. He and Ernest were great chums. I felt sorry for the boy who was to lose his pet. Don't take it so hard, Ern, I said, trying to comfort him. Uncle will likely get another pup. I don't want any other pup, Ernest blurted out. Oh, Ned, won't you try and coax your uncle not to sell him? Perhaps he'd listen to you. I shook my head. I knew Uncle Richard too well to hope that. Not in this case, Ern, I said. He would say it did not concern me, and you know nothing moves him when he determines on a thing. You'll have to reconcile yourself to losing Laddie, I'm afraid. Ernest's tow-colored head went down on Laddie's neck again, and I, deciding that there was no use in saying anything more, proceeded towards the shore, which was about a mile from Uncle Richard's house. The beach along his farm, and for several farms along shore, was a lonely, untenanted one for the fisher folk all lived two miles further down, at Rowley's Cove. About three hundred yards from the shore was the peculiar formation known as Island Rock. This was a large rock that stood abruptly up out of the water. Below, about the usual waterline, it was seamed and fissured, but its summit rose up in a narrow, flat-topped peak. At low tide, twenty feet of it was above water, but at high tide it was six feet, and often more under water. I pushed Uncle Richard's small flat down the rough path and rode out to Island Rock. Arriving there, I thrust the painter deep into the narrow cleft. This was the usual way of mooring it and no doubt of its safety occurred to me. I scrambled up the rock and around to the eastern end, where there was a broader space for standing, and from which some capital views could be obtained. The sea about the rock was calm, but there was quite a swell on, and an offshore breeze was blowing. There were no boats visible. The tide was low leaving bare the curious caves and headlands along shore. And I secured a number of excellent snapshots. It was now three o'clock. I must wait another hour yet before I could get the best view of the hole in the wall, a huge arch-like opening through a jutting headland to the west of me. I went around to look at it when I saw a sight that made me stop short in dismay. This was nothing less than the flat, drifting outward around the point. The swell and suction of the water around the rock must have pulled her loose, and I was a prisoner.
At first my only feeling was one of annoyance. Then a thought flashed into my mind that made me dizzy with fear. The tide would be high that night. If I could not escape from Island Rock, I would inevitably be drowned. I sat down limply on a ledge and tried to look matters fairly in the face. I could not swim. Calls for help could not reach anybody. My only hope lay in the chance of somebody passing down the shore, or of some boat appearing. I looked at my watch. It was a quarter past three. The tide would begin to turn about five, but it would be at least ten before the rock would be covered. I had then little more than six hours to live, unless rescued. The flat was by this time out of sight, around the point. I hoped that the sight of an empty flat, drifting down shore, might attract someone's attention and lead to investigation. That seemed to be my only hope. No alarm would be felt at Uncle Richard's because of my non-appearance. They would suppose I had gone to Uncle Adam's. I have heard of time seeming long to a person in my predicament. But to me it seemed fairly to fly, for every moment decreased my chance of rescue. I determined I would not give way to cowardly fear. So, with a murmured prayer for help, I set myself to the task of waiting for death as bravely as possible. At intervals I shouted as loudly as I could, and when the sun came to the proper angle for the best view of the hole in the wall, I took the picture. It afterwards turned out to be a great success, but I have never been able to look at it without a shudder. At five the tide began to come in. Very, very slowly the water rose around Island Rock. Up, up, up it came, while I watched it with fascinated eyes, feeling like a rat in a trap. The sun fell lower and lower. At eight o'clock the moon rose large and bright. At nine it was a lovely night, dear, calm, bright as day, and the water was swishing over the highest ledge of the rock. With some difficulty I climbed to the top and sat there to await the end. I had no longer any hope of rescue, but by a great effort I preserved self-control. If I had to die, I would at least face death staunchly. But when I thought of my mother at home, it tasked all my energies to keep from breaking down utterly. Suddenly I heard a whistle. Never was sound so sweet. I stood up and peered eagerly shoreward. Coming around the hole in the wall headland, on top of the cliffs, I saw a boy and a dog. I sent a wild halloo ringing shoreward. The boy started, stopped, and looked out towards Island Rock. The next moment he hailed me. It was Ernest's voice, and it was Laddie who was barking beside him. Ernest, I shouted wildly, run for help, quick, quick. The tide will be over the rock in half an hour. Hurry, or you will be too late. Instead of starting off at full speed, as I expected him to do, Ernest stood still for a moment, and then began to pick his steps down a narrow path over the cliff, followed by Laddie. Ernest, I shouted frantically, what are you doing? Why don't you go for help? Ernest had by this time reached a narrow ledge of rock just above the waterline. I noticed that he was carrying something over his arm. It will take too long, he shouted. By the time I got to the cove, 
and a boat could row back here, you'd be drowned. Laddie and I will save you. Is there anything, dear, you can tie a rope to? I have a coil of rope here that I think will be long enough to reach you. I've been down to the cove, and Alec Martin sent it up to your uncle. I looked about me. A smooth, round hole had been worn clean through a thin part of the apex of the rock. I could fasten the rope if I had it, I called. But how can you get it to me? For answer, Ernest tied a bit of driftwood to the rope and put it into Laddie's mouth. The next minute, the dog was swimming out to me. As soon as he came close, I caught the rope. It was just long enough to stretch from shore to rock, allowing for a couple of hitches, which Ernest gave around the small boulder on the ledge. I tied my camera case on my head by means of some string I found in my pocket. Then I slipped into the water and, holding the rope, went hand over hand to the shore, with Laddie swimming beside me. Ernest held on to the shoreward end of the rope like grim death, a task that was no light one for his small arms. When I finally scrambled up beside him, his face was dripping with perspiration, and he trembled like a leaf. Ern, you are a prick, I exclaimed. You've saved my life. No, it was Laddie, said Ernest, refusing to take any credit at all. We hurried home and arrived at Uncle Richard's about ten, just as they were going to bed. When Uncle Richard heard what had happened, he turned very pale and murmured, Thank God. Aunt Kate got me out of my wet clothes as quickly as possible put me away to bed in hot blankets, and dosed me with ginger tea. I slept like a top, and felt none the worse for my experience the next morning. At the breakfast table, Uncle Richard scarcely spoke, but, just as we finished, he said abruptly to Ernest, I'm not going to sell Laddie. You and the dog saved Ned's life between you and no dog who helped do that is ever going to be sold by me. Henceforth he belongs to you. I give him to you for your very own. Oh, Mr. Lawson, said Ernest with shining eyes. I never saw a boy look so happy. As for Laddie, who was sitting beside him with his shaggy head on Ernest's knee, I really believe the dog understood, too. The look in his eyes was almost human. Uncle Richard leaned over and patted him. Good dog, he said. Good dog. At five o'clock in the morning. Fate in the guise of Mrs. Emery, dropping a milk can on the platform under his open window, awakened Murray that morning. Had not Mrs. Emery dropped that can, he would have slumbered peacefully until his usual hour for rising. A late one, be it admitted, for all the boarders at Sweetbriar Cottage, Murray was the most irregular in his habits. When a young man, Mrs. Emery was wont to remark sagely and a trifle severely, prowls about that pond half of the night, a chasing of things what he calls moonlight effects. It ain't to be wondered at that he's sleeping in the morning. And it ain't the convenientest thing, another and no ways, to keep the breakfast table set till the farm folks are thinking of dinner. But them artist men are not like other people, say what you will, and allowance has to be made for them. And I must say that I likes him real well, and approves of him every other way. If Murray had slept late that morning, 
well, he shuddered yet over that if. But a foreset fate saw to it that he woke when the hour of destiny and the milk can struck, and having awakened he found he could not go to sleep again. It suddenly occurred to him that he had never seen a sunrise on the pond. Doubtless it would be very lovely down there, in those dewy meadows, at such a primitive hour. He decided to get up and see what the world looked like in the young daylight. He scowled at a letter lying on his dressing table and thrust it into his pocket that it might be out of sight. He had written it the night before, and the writing of it was going to cost him several things, a prospective million among others. So it is hardly to be wondered at if the sight of it did not reconcile him to the joys of early rising. Here, life and heart, exclaimed Mrs. Emery, pausing in the act of scalding a milk can, when Mary emerged from a side door. What on earth is the matter, Mr. Murray? You ain't sick now, surely. I told you them pond fogs was pison of the night. If you've gone and got. Nothing is the matter, dear lady, interrupted Mary, and I haven't gone and got anything except an acute attack of early rising, which is not in the least likely to become chronic. But at what hour of the night do you get up, you wonderful woman? Or rather, do you ever go to bed at all? Here is the sun only beginning to rise, and positively yes, you have all your cows milked. Mrs. Emery purred with delight. Folks as has fourteen cows to milk has to rise bedtimes, she answered with proud humility. Laws, I don't complain. I've lots of help with the milking. How Mrs. Palmer manages, I really cannot comprehend, or rather, how she has managed. I suppose she'll be all right now, since her niece came last night. I saw her posting to the pond pasture not ten minutes ago. She'll have to milk all them seven cows herself. But dear life and heart, here I'd be palavering away and not a bite of breakfast ready for you. I don't want any breakfast until the regular time for it, assured Mary. I'm going down to the pond to see the sunrise. Now, don't you go and get caught in the mash, anxiously called Mrs. Emery, as she never failed to do when she saw him starting for the pond. Nobody ever had got caught in a marsh. But Mrs. Emery lived in a chronic state of fear, lest somebody should. And if you once got stuck in that black mud, you'd be stuck right down and never seen or heard tell off again till the day of judgment, like Adam Palmer's cow. She was wont to warn her boarders. Murray sought his favorite spot for pond dreaming. A bloomy corner of the pasture that ran down into the blue water, with a dump of leafy maples on the left. He was very glad he had risen early. A miracle was being worked before his very eyes. The world was in a flush and tremor of maiden loveliness instinct with all the marvelous fleeting charm of girlhood and spring and young morning. Overhead the sky was a vast high-sprung arch of unstained crystal. Down over the sand dunes where the pond ran out into the sea was a great arc of primrose smitten through with auroral crimsonings. Beneath it the pond waters shimmered with a hundred fairy hues, but just before him they were clear as a flawless mirror. The fields around him glistened with dews and a little wandering wind, blowing lightly from some born in the hills, straight down over the slopes. 
bringing with it an unimaginable odor and freshness, and fluttered over the pond, leaving a little path of dancing silver ripples across the mirror glory of the water. Birds were singing in the beechwood over on Orchard Knob Farm, answering to each other from shore to shore until the very air was tremulous with elfin music of this wonderful midsummer dawn. I will get up at sunrise every morning of my life hereafter, exclaimed Mary rapturously, not meaning a syllable of it, but devoutly believing he did. Just as the fiery disk of the sun peered over the sand dunes, Mary heard music that was not of the birds. It was a girl's voice singing beyond the maples to his left, a clear, sweet voice, blithely thrilling out the old-fashioned song, Five O'Clock in the Morning. Mrs. Palmer's niece! Mary sprang to his feet and tiptoed cautiously through the maples. He had heard so much from Mrs. Palmer about her niece that he felt reasonably well acquainted with her. Moreover, Mrs. Palmer had assured him that Molly was a very pretty girl. Now a pretty girl milking cows at sunrise, in the meadows, sounded well. Mrs. Palmer had not overrated her niece's beauty. Murray said so to himself with a little whistle of amazement as he leaned unseen on the pasture fence and looked at the girl who was milking a placid jersey less than ten yards away from him. Murray's artistic instinct responded to the whole scene with a thrill of satisfaction. He could see only her profile, but that was perfect and the coloring of the oval cheek and the beautiful curve of the chin were something to adore. Her hair, ruffled in lovable little ringlets by the morning wind, was coiled in glistening chestnut masses high on her bare head, and her arms, bare to the elbow, were as white as marble. Presently she began to sing again, and this time Mary joined in. She half rose from the milking stool and cast a startled glance at the maples. Then she dropped back again and began to milk determinedly. But Mary could have sworn that he saw a demure smile hovering about her lips. That and the revelation of her full face decided him. He sprang over the fence and sauntered across the intervening space of lush clover blossoms. Good morning, he said coolly. He had forgotten her other name, and it did not matter. At five o'clock in the morning, people who meet in dewy clover fields might disregard the conventionalities. Isn't it rather a large contract for you to be milking seven cows all alone? May I help you? Molly looked up at him over her shoulder. She had glorious gray eyes. Her face was serene and undisturbed. Can you milk? she asked. Unlikely as it may seem, I can, said Mary. I have never confessed it to Mrs. Emery, because I was afraid she would inveigle me into milking her footing cows but I don't mind helping you. I learned to milk when I was a shaver on my vacations at a grandfatherly farm. May I have that extra pail? Mary captured a milking stool and rounded up another jersey. Before sitting down, he seemed struck with an idea. My name is Arnold Mary. I board at Sweetbriar Cottage next farm to Orchard Knob. That makes us near neighbors. I suppose it does, said Molly. Murray mentally decided that her voice was the sweetest he had ever heard. He was glad he had arranged his cow 
at such an angle that he could study her profile. It was amazing that Mrs. Palmer's niece should have such a profile. It looked as if centuries of fine breeding were responsible for it. What a morning, he said enthusiastically. It harks back to the days when Earth was young. They must have had just such mornings as this in Eden. Do you always get up so early? asked Molly practically. Always, said Mary with a blush. Then, but no, that is a fib. And I cannot tell fibs to you. The truth is your tribute. I never get up early. It was fate that roused me and brought me here this morning. The morning is a miracle, and you, I might suppose you were born of the sunrise, if Mrs. Palmer hadn't told me all about you. What did she tell you about me? asked Molly, changing cows. Mary discovered that she was tall and that the big blue print apron shrouded a singularly graceful figure. She said you were the best-looking girl in Bruce County. I have seen very few of the girls in Bruce County, but I know she is right. That compliment is not nearly so pretty as the sunrise one, said Molly reflectively. Mrs. Palmer has told me things about you, she added. Curiosity knows no gender hinted Mary. She said you were good-looking and lazy and different from other people. All compliments, said Mary in a gratified tone. Lazy? Certainly. Laziness is a virtue in these strenuous days. I was not born with it, but I have painstakingly acquired it, and I am proud of my success. I have time to enjoy life. I think that I like you, said Molly. You have the merit of being able to enter into a situation, he assured her. When the last jersey was milked, they carried the pails down to the spring, where the creamers were sunk and strained the milk into them. Mary washed the pails, and Molly wiped them and set them in the gleaming row on the shelf under the big maple. Thank you, she said. You're not going yet, said Mary resolutely. The time I saved you in milking three cows belongs to me. We will spend it in a walk along the pond shore. I will show you a path I have discovered under the beaches. It is just wide enough for two. Come. He took her hand and drew her through the copse into a green lane, where the ferns grew thickly on either side, and the pond waters plashed dreamily below them. He kept her hand in his as they went down the path, and she did not try to withdraw it. About them was the great, pure silence of the morning, faintly threaded with caressing sounds, croon of the birds, gurgle of waters, sound of wind. The spirit of youth and love hovered over them, and they spoke no word. When they finally came out on a little green nook, swimming in early sunshine and arched over by maples, with the white shimmer of the pond before it, and the gold dust of blossoms over the grass, the girl drew a long breath, of delight. It is a morning left over from Eden, isn't it? said Mary. Yes, said Molly softly. Mary bent toward her. You are Eve, he said. You are the only woman in the world for me. Adam must have told Eve just what he thought about her the first time he saw her. There were no conventionalities in Eden, and people could not have taken long to make up their minds. We are in Eden just now. One can say what he thinks in Eden, 
without being ridiculous. You are divinely fair, Eve. Your eyes are stars of the morning. Your cheek has the flush it stole from the sunrise. Your lips are redder than the roses of paradise. And I love you, Eve. Molly lowered her eyes, and the long fringe of her lashes lay in a burnished Zema circle on her cheek. I think, she said slowly, that it must have been very delightful in Eden. But we are not really there, you know. We are only playing that we are. And it is time for me to go back. I must get to breakfast. That sounds too prosaic for paradise. Mary bent still closer. Before we remember that we are only playing at paradise, will you kiss me, dear Eve? You are very audacious, said Molly coldly. We are in Eden yet, he urged. That makes all the difference. Well, said Molly, and Mary kissed her. They had passed back over the fern path and were in the pasture before either spoke again. Then Mary said, We have left Eden behind, but we can always return there when we will. And although we were only playing at paradise, I was not playing at love. I meant all I said to Molly. Have you meant it often? asked Molly significantly. I never meant it or even played at it before he answered. I did, at one time, contemplate the possibility of playing at it, but that was long ago, as long ago as last night. I am glad to the core of my soul that I decided against it before I met you, dear Eve. I have the letter of decision in my coat pocket this moment. I meant to mail it this afternoon. Curiosity knows no gender, quoted Molly. Then, to satisfy your curiosity, I must bore you with some personal history. My parents died when I was a little chap, and my uncle brought me up. He has been immensely good to me, but he is a bit of a tyrant. Recently he picked out a wife for me, the daughter of an old sweetheart of his. I have never ever seen her, but she has arrived in town on a visit to some relatives there. Uncle Dick wrote to me to return home at once and pay my court to the lady. I protested. He wrote again, a letter short and reverse of sweet. If I refused to do my best to win Miss Mannering, he would disown me. Never speak to me again. Cut me off with a quarter. Uncle always means what he says. That is one of our family traits, you understand. I spent some miserable, undecided days. It was not the threat of disinheritance that worried me, although when you have been brought up to regard yourself as a prospective millionaire, it is rather difficult to adjust your vision to a proper focus. But it was the thought of alienating Uncle Dick. I love the dear, determined old chap like a father, but last night my guardian angel was with me, and I decided to remain my own man. So I wrote to Uncle Dick, respectfully, but firmly declining to become a candidate for Miss Mannering's hand. But you have never seen her, said Molly. She may be almost charming. If she be not fair to me, what care I how fair she be? quoted Murray. As you say, she may be almost charming, but she's not Eve. She is merely one of a million other women, as far as I'm concerned. Don't let's talk of her. Let us talk only of ourselves. There is nothing else that is half so interesting. And will your uncle really cast you off? asked Molly. Not a doubt of it. What will you do? Work, dear Eve. 
My carefully acquired laziness must be thrown to the winds, and I shall work. That is the rule outside of Eden. Don't worry. I've painted pictures that have actually been sold. I'll make a living for us somehow. Us? Of course, you are engaged to me. I am not, said Molly indignantly. Molly, Molly, after that kiss. Fie, fie. You are very absurd, said Molly, but your absurdity has been amusing. I have, yes, positively, I have enjoyed your Eden comedy. But now you must not come any further with me. My aunt might not approve. Here is my path to Orchard Knob Farmhouse. There, I presume, is yours to Sweetbriar Cottage. Good morning. I'm coming over to see you this afternoon, said Mary coolly. But you needn't be afraid. I will not tell tales out of Eden. I will be a hypocrite and pretend to Mrs. Palmer that we have never met before. But you and I will know and remember. Now you may go. I reserve to myself the privilege of standing here and watching you out of sight. That afternoon, Murray strolled over to Orchard Knob, going into the kitchen without knocking, as was the habit in that free and easy world. Mrs. Palmer was lying on the lounge with a pungent handkerchief bound about her head, but keeping a vigilant eye on a very pretty, very plump brown-eyed girl who was stirring a kettleful of cherry preserve on the range. Good afternoon, Mrs. Palmer, said Mary, wondering where Molly was. I'm sorry to see that you look something like an invalid. I have a raging, ramping headache, said Mrs. Palmer solemnly. I had it all night, and I'm good for nothing. Molly, you'd better take them cherries off. Mr. Murray, this is my niece, Molly Booth. What? said Mary explosively. Miss Molly Booth, repeated Mrs. Palmer in a louder tone. Mary regained outward self-control and bowed to the blushing Molly. And what about Eve? he thought helplessly. Who, what was she? Did I dream her? Was she a phantom of delight? No, no, phantoms don't milk cows. She was flesh and blood. No chilly nymph exhaling from the mists of the marsh could have given a kiss like that. Molly has come to stay the rest of the summer with me, said Mrs. Palmer. I hope to goodness my tribulations with hired girls is over at last. They have made a wreck of me. Murray rapidly reflected. This development, he decided, released him from his promise to tell no tales. I met a young lady down in the pond pasture this morning, he said deliberately. I talked with her for a few minutes. I supposed her to be your niece. Who was she? Oh, that was Miss Mannering, said Mrs. Palmer. What? said Mary again. Mannering, Dora Mannering, said Mrs. Palmer loudly, wondering if Mr. Murray were losing his hearing. She came here last night, just to see me. I haven't seen her since she was a child of twelve. I used to be her nurse before I was married. I was that proud to think she thought it worth her while to look me up. And mind you, this morning, when she found me crippled with headache and not able to do a hand's turn, that girl, Mr. Murray, went and milked seven cows. Only four, murmured Murray, but Mrs. Palmer did not hear him. For me. Couldn't prevent her. She said she had learned to milk for fun one summer when she was in the country, and she did it. 
and then she got breakfast for the men. Molly didn't come till the ten o'clock train. Miss Mannering is as capable as if she had been a viz on a farm. Where is she now? demanded Mary. Oh, she's gone. What? Gone, shouted Mrs. Palmer. Gone. She left on the train Molly came on. Gracious me, has the man gone crazy? He hasn't seemed like himself at all this afternoon. Mary had bolted madly out of the house and was striding down the lane. Blind fool, unspeakable idiot that he had been. To take her for Mrs. Palmer's niece, that peerless creature with the calm acceptance of any situation which marked the woman of the world, with the fine appreciation and quickness of repartee that spoke of generations of culture, to imagine that she could be Molly Booth. He had been blind, besottenly blind, and now he had lost her. She would never forgive him. She had gone without a word or sign. As he reached the last curve of the lane, where it looped about the apple trees, a plump figure came flying down the orchard slopes. Mr. Murray! Mr. Murray! Molly Booth called breathlessly. Will you please come here just a minute? Murray crossed over to the paling rather crumpily. He did not want to talk with Molly Booth just then. Confound it. What did the girl want? Why was she looking so mysterious? Molly produced a little square grey envelope from some feminine hiding place and handed it over the paling. She give me this at the station. Miss Mannering did, she gasped, and asked me to give it to you without letting Aunt Emily Jane see. I couldn't get a chance when you was in, but as soon as you went I slipped out by the porch door and followed you. You went so fast, I nearly died trying to head you off. You dear little soul, said Mary, suddenly radiant. It is too bad you have had to put yourself so out of breath on my account. But I am immensely obliged to you. The next time your young man wants a trusty private messenger, just refer him to me. Get away with you, giggled Molly. I must hurry back, for Aunt Emily Jane gets wind I'm gone. I hope there's good news in your girl's letter. My, but didn't you look flat when Aunt said she'd went? Mary beamed at her idiotically. When she had vanished among the trees, he opened his letter. Dear Mr. Mary, it ran, Your unblushing audacity of the morning deserves some punishment. I hereby punish you by prompting departure from Orchard Knob. Yet I do not dislike audacity, at some times, in some places, in some people. It is only from a sense of duty that I punish it in this case. And it was really pleasant in Eden. If you do not mail that letter, and if you still persist in that very absurd interpretation of the meaning of Eve's kiss, we may meet again in town. Until then, I remain very sincerely yours, Dora Lynn Mannering. Mary kissed the grey letter and put it tenderly away in his pocket. And then he took his letter to his uncle and tore it into tiny fragments. Finally, he looked at his watch. If I hurry, I can catch the afternoon train to town, he said. <laughs>